Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome to the stage our partner in this debate. We are partnering for this debate with Foreign Affairs Magazine. We are delighted to have a partnership of that level of prestige and intellect and importance and weight. So please welcome the editor of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Gideon Rose. Gideon, we're delighted to be, uh, this is our first time partnering with, uh, with, with Foreign Affairs. And how, how did this come about? Why is it important for you to be partnered with us? Well, we love Intelligence Squared, and we couldn't think of a better partnership because essentially the best way to think of foreign affairs is as the home version of Intelligence Squared. It's something you can play uh, by yourself or with friends and family. It's easy. You basically take a policy question that you care about, write down your answer, read your copy of foreign affairs, and then check your answer and vote again. Uh, that's how you play at home. Uh, because what we offer in FA is essentially very smart, serious people honestly trying to provide constructive answers to important and interesting practical questions and have the kind of debate that should be had in a democracy over important public issues. Does that and suggest that's what you do as well. Well, does that suggest that one wants to read foreign affairs with a willingness to change one's mind? Uh, you know, all of our authors are smarter than uh, the editorial staff, and they take very different positions on all the major issues. And so it's a constant education for us, and we hope it is for our readers as well. Our job is to translate the smart people in our pages to translate their words and ideas into ones that everybody can understand. Just a, minute, a, a moment on tonight's resolution. Uh, we're looking back 10 years. Normally, we look at the present. We are actually looking at the future, but we're using the 10-year-old benchmark uh, as, our, as, our measure, as our metric in a sense. But why does that topic interest you in particular? Well, uh, because these days, obviously, not just our domestic and international events related, but security and economic spheres are related. And a global financial crisis and the turbulence that we saw a decade ago has been an extraordinarily uh, significant factor in weakening the liberal international order, affecting world politics in various ways, hurting lots of people. And the question of whether we have responded successfully, whether we have made the system better, is something we've been covering in the pages of foreign affairs. And we're delighted to sort of be partners with you guys in a debate by really serious people trying to assess whether the measures that have been taken have been enough or not. Well, thank you for the partnership. We really are excited about it, and I hope everybody enjoys this relationship and what unfolds in a live way tonight as a result of it. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, Gideon Rose. Absolutely. Thank Thanks very much. Remember that brink that we all stood on the edge on, that cliff that we all nearly went over, our society and several others? It was called the global financial crisis. The year was 2008, and certainly many, many, many individuals were hurt by it. But the thing that people were predicting and fearing, the total meltdown of the global financial system, that never came to pass thanks to huge bailouts and also just plain luck, after which, of course, we pledged to take measures to make sure that we would never come that close to total meltdown again. And in fact, we haven't. And why is that? Is that because we did figure out what sorts of safeguards we need? Are we, in fact, safer? Or are we still basically running on luck? Well, we think that has the makings of a debate, so let's have it. Yes or no to this statement. 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. I'm John Donvan. This is Intelligence Squared US. We are on the stage at the K Playhouse in New York City with four eminently qualified debaters who will argue for and against that resolution. As always, our debate will go in three rounds, and if all goes well, civil discourse will also win. Let's meet our debaters. Our resolution is this. Ten years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. Here to argue for the resolution, please welcome Jason Furman. Jason, welcome back to Intelligence Squared. You spent eight years as a top economic advisor to the Obama administration. You're now at the Harvard Kennedy School. You're also a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. You have, as I said, debated with us a few times before, and in fact, you have never lost a debate. So what's your strategy? I try to pick great partners. <laughs> and that brings us to our next debater. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Neil Kashkari. Yeah. 
Neil, in addition to having just been paid the highest compliment, you are <laughs> no also the, the president and the CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, before that, you were seriously a player in some of the issues we're going to be discussing tonight. You uh, were at the Treasury Department. You were the man in charge of TARP. That was the Troubled Asset Relief Program during the 2008 financial crisis. But before all of that, you were an engineer who worked on a telescope. How, how, I didn't see that coming. How did that happen? I studied engineering in college and started out my career as an aerospace engineer. Uh, loved it, but wanted to learn about business, so ended up going back to business school, and then that led me into economics and banking and finance. What an interesting life. Thanks very much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, the team arguing for the resolution 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. We have two debaters arguing against it. Please first welcome Kenneth Rogoff. <laughs> Ken, welcome. Uh, you're a professor of public policy and economics at Harvard. You were once a chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. You're a best-selling author. You've written a bunch of books, one of them quite relevant to the topic we're discussing tonight. It's titled, This Time It's Different. What were you trying to say with that title? Well, it's supposed to be ironic because this time isn't different when it comes to financial crises. Thanks very much, Ken Rogoff. <laughs> And, and speaking about what's different, um, some of you may recognize the fourth debater and the other member of the team arguing against Robert Rosencrantz. Robert Rosencrantz happens to be, in addition to being the chairman of Delphi Capital Management uh, and the chairman of Intelligence Squared U.S. Foundation, our chairman, uh, normally sits in the seats out there with you, his first time on this stage. He has taken this seat on very short notice but has a very long career building expertise in the topics that we're debating tonight so it all works out. Bob, welcome to the stage. It's probably, honestly, it's probably a lot easier sitting out there than it is up here. Yes, much, <laughs> much nicer. Much nicer. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Rosencrantz and the team arguing against the resolution. So on to the debate. We begin with round one. Round one are opening statements by each debater in turn. They will be six minutes each. Speaking first for the resolution, 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. Here is Neil Kashkari, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Kashkari. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Intelligence Squared and Foreign Affairs. Uh, thanks to my partner, Jason, and our esteemed opponents, uh, Ken and Robert, and of course, to the audience. Thank you all for being here on this really important topic. I was really surprised when I was asked to argue this motion, to argue in favor of the notion that the system is safer. Because while I ran the TARP, so I was in the middle of the financial crisis back in 07, 08, 09, I have become one of the biggest critics of the banks in America. The banks really don't like me because I've been very outspoken saying we need to do more. We need to be tougher on the banks to protect taxpayers, to protect the public against future financial crises. So why would I argue in favor of this motion? Because the motion is not, are we perfectly safe? We're not. The motion is, are we safer than we were 10 years ago? And Jason and I are going to argue that unquestionably we are safer than we were 10 years ago. Now, both Jason and I want to go further. We want to be even tougher. But the question is, have we made progress? The answer is yes, we have made progress. So Jason and I have analyzed this across five different dimensions that we're going to lay out for you tonight. And on three of those dimensions, we're going to demonstrate that the system is safer. On two of the dimensions, we're going to demonstrate that the system is the same. So three dimensions safer, two dimensions the same. Overall, we're going to argue that means the system is, in fact, safer than we were 10 years ago. I'm going to start with the first three of these dimensions, and then Jason later is going to follow up with the other two dimensions. So first dimension are the big banks. You all remember the 08 crisis. The big banks were at the center of this crisis. And I want to be tougher on the big banks. But the biggest banks are safer than they were 10 years ago, and we should be honest about that. So the single best thing you can do to make a bank safe is make sure it has enough capital to protect the taxpayers in case it makes mistakes. So what is capital? If you take out a loan to buy a house, the bank is going to make you put a down payment. My wife and I had to put 20% down in our house. The more money you put down, the safer your loan is. If you put down 30%, it's safer than if you put down 20%. Well, banks have to put down some money on their own investments, and they have about twice as much capital as they had 10 years ago. That means they're safer. 
Banks also, you know, they borrow money. When you deposit money in a bank, the, money, the bank is borrowing your money. And the more of that money that people can pull out very quickly, the riskier the bank. Well, the bank, that's how they fund themselves. They're funding themselves longer term, so the money cannot simply be pulled out as quickly as it was 10 years ago. By that dimension, the banks are safer. And then regulators have a lot of additional tools to deal with banks if they do get into trouble. So uh, Jason and I are gonna argue that it's unquestionable the big banks are safer than they were 10 years ago, though we agree we wanna go even further. So that's dimension number one. Dimension number two, what about the non-banks? What about the rest of the financial system? You've heard of things like mortgage-backed securities. Wall Street takes a bunch of mortgages, they package them together, they slice them up, and then they sell them all around the world. That was one of the key risks in the financial crisis. That activity has fallen by about 75% securitization from where it was 10 years ago. Or if you take money market funds, you might remember that there was a famous fund that led to Lehman's failure where a money market fund blew up. That activity is now 75% of the, of the money market, the risky money market funds, 75% lower than it was 10 years ago. You've probably heard about people getting loans where no money down, no documenting income, they call them ninja loans. No income, no job, no asset, you get a mortgage, right? That's no more. You can't do that anymore. So if you look outside of the banking sector, it's clear that the rest of the financial system is also safer than it was 10 years ago. So two dimensions that I've talked about so far. The banks, safer. The non-banks, the rest of the financial system, also safer. Now I want to shift to talk about what do we do if a crisis actually happens? So I want to talk about monetary policy. So I'm president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. I have one of the policymakers who sets monetary policy for the nation. If there's a recession or if there's a crisis, typically what the Federal Reserve will do is it'll cut interest rates to try to, to, try to stimulate the economy. And you may remember interest rates are lower today than they were 10 years ago. They're around 2.5% for the federal funds rate. Well, so people will say, well, that means the Federal Reserve has less room to cut than it did 10 years ago, and that's true. But we have other tools to also stimulate the economy. You might have heard of something called quantitative easing, where the Federal Reserve will go out and buy long-term bonds to try to drive down long-term interest rates. The reason that we do that is if there's a recession, we want to make it cheaper for you to go get a mortgage or for a business to go get a loan. Well, one of the things that the Fed has now that we didn't have 10 years ago, we have a lot more experience using some of these other tools. The Fed did it in the crisis, but it, they weren't sure if it was going to work, and they weren't sure if it was going to have all sorts of unintended consequences. 10 years later, we have a lot more experience that we had on how to use these other tools. So it is true that interest rates are lower, so there's less room to cut, but these other tools, we have more confidence and experience in using them. So overall on monetary policy, Jason and I think we're about where we were. We're about even. So I've presented three dimensions to you. Two of them were clearly safer. One of them were neutral. Jason's going to come up later and argue in the other two, we've made some progress, and in another case, we're neutral. Overall, the system is safer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil Kashkari. The resolution again, 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. Here to make his opening statement against the motion, Robert Rosencrantz, who is chairman of Delphi Capital Management and the Intelligence Squared U.S. Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Rosencrantz. Uh, so Neil has spoken a lot about the banking system and the quality of the assets in the non-bank uh, financial institutions. But that is not the system. The system is a much more complex uh, web of relationships than that. And the most important relationship, in, in my mind, is the tendency of, or the vulnerability, of the system to the failure of a single bank. So how does that come about? Well, it comes about because uh, the interrelationship of banks. And the biggest uh, source of that interrelationship is uh, derivatives, over-the-counter derivatives. There are some $10 trillion of over-the-counter derivatives outstanding. The total capital of the banking system is about $1.2 trillion. And because these are over-the-counter, there's no real market for them. Banks mark them according to models. The models are inconsistent. They're subject to error. 
So the system is extremely opaque and very interdependent. The other thing that creates uh, the potential for crisis is um, when everybody in the market wants to act in the same way at the same time. Well, again, things have gotten worse in that dimension. Uh, first of all, the spread of algorithmic trading. There is so much money uh, that is being traded on uh, computer algorithms that have no human intervention and that tend to all go in the same direction at the same time. Another thing that exacerbates this is the role of rating agencies because they basically force all market participants to behave more or less the same way, again at the same time. We have about 45% of our uh, uh, investment grade bond market is now rated triple B, one downgrade, and it's junk, and all those holders have to, uh, are forced to sell in unison. So if you imagine that the financial system is a car at the crest of a hill that's gotten out of control, a lot of the accelerators of trouble are at least as much as they were 10 years ago, if not more. So let's talk about the breaks. Well, what are the breaks? One is the potential for reduced interest rates. As Neil has acknowledged, at a 2.5% level, there's not very far to cut. One is the, uh, another potential break is the uh, ability to provide fiscal stimulation. Well, we're running about a 5% deficit at the peak of an economic expansion. Uh, far less room for, uh, for fiscal stimulation now than there was a decade ago. And the final thing is that uh, last time the financial crisis featured a very high degree of cooperation internationally. The, the central banks of the world and the regulators really did get their act together, coordinated a, a global response. Well, it seems pretty obvious to me that the uh, ability to create uh, global uh, coordination is much, much lower now. Uh, China is a much more important factor in the global equation. Our relationships there are, are, are broken. Uh, Europe and, and uh, the UK are now uh, going their separate ways in a chaotic fashion. Uh, so the, the potential for international cooperation is far, uh, far less than it was. So you have more a heavier pedal on the metal of the accelerator when you're in trouble, and you have a much weaker set of, of brakes. And the final ingredient to me is what I would call the shock absorber. The shock absorber in the system is liquidity. The ability of somebody to come into markets where everybody is going in the opposite direction. And banks used to have that role. Banks used to be money, uh, uh, market makers and all the regulation that uh, uh, they're so proud of has actually regulated them to a very diminished role as market makers, which means that if there's any event that triggers a wave of selling, it's the magnitude becomes very extreme. And I'll give you a recent example. Uh, the leverage loan market is about a uh, trillion dollars. In December, about $5 billion, less than 5%, was uh, sold because uh, some liquidations of uh, redemptions of some ETFs and mutual funds. That little $5 billion in a trillion dollar market drove it from 100 to 93, wiping out $70 billion of value. And that's just a little ripple in some small corner of, uh, of the uh, universe. So I think the shock absorbers in the system, the liquidity in the system, has been seriously, seriously compromised. And any event, uh, whatever it is, that triggers a uh, coordinated action by market participants is more apt now than it was then to, uh, to uh, create a major crisis. So for that reason, we're asking you to vote that the uh, system is not safer. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Rosenkranz. Please welcome to the lectern. Arguing for the resolution, Jason Furman, former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Furman. <laughs> 
great. Um, it's great to be back, great to be with all of you, with a current colleague, Ken, former colleague, um, Neil. I think Bob's argument illustrated a lot of our point. I was worried about almost everything he raised, but every time he raised something, I was thinking to myself, boy, do I feel better about that given the changes we've made today than I did um, 10 years ago. Take something like derivatives. Um, 10 years ago, they were the Wild West. You could invent them, you could customize them, you could just do them between any two people. Um, you know, are there too many of them? Are they too risky now? Yeah, but they're much more standardized. You have to do them. Uh, most of them have moved to what's called central clearing houses, where all of them go through a place much more transparent. Um, and I think really importantly, you know, we used to look really carefully at some of like our community banks to make sure they had enough capital, what Neil was talking about, so important with banks. Um, some of the places we didn't used to look at, um, Lehman Brothers, I don't know if any of you remember that, it hasn't been around for a bit, um, but we barely examined that in any way. We barely examined AIG, and we're looking at all of those places in the financial system now. Maybe not enough, maybe not as much as we should, um, but now those systemically important institutions get designated as such. They fall under the Federal Reserve. Um, and so a lot of the parts of the financial system Bob is talking about really were the Wild West. We didn't even try to look at them, and we've brought a modicum of order to them. Um, we're looking at them. Um, Neil gave you three arguments. Um, I want to now talk about um, two more. The first is international. Um, when I was in the White House, once we got through you know, the worst of our part of the crisis, I spent the last six years of the administration um, losing far more sleep over what was happening overseas than what was happening in the United States, the Eurozone crisis, China, um, and the like. I'm not losing sleep anymore. Mostly that's because I'm not in the White House anymore. <laughs> um, but some of that's you know, a little bit better um, than it was. And let me just tick through the areas internationally. Europe, a lot of the reforms Neil talked about here have happened there. So their banks are also holding more capital. They also have more of a cushion before there's a crisis. Europe also regulated its banks. Each country had separate regulation. And if you thought a country like Greece was getting in trouble, you also thought they weren't, their banks were gonna get in trouble and you could have this sort of what's called a doom loop between those. There's still a risk of that, but now across the Eurozone, there is a single supervisor and there's a single authority to deal with banks if they get into problems. They've also created something called the European Stability Mechanism that has 700 700 billion euro didn't exist before, and that's there to aid countries um, in a crisis. Greece came close to the brink, but the willingness to keep them in the system was critical to where it is today. In addition to Europe, the IMF has more resources than it had going into the crisis. Central banks in the crisis invented this thing where they'd be willing to swap money, they'd lend each other money. That's now institutionalized, so I actually think we have more global cooperation that we're starting from now for the next crisis. And something we used to worry a lot about and we've forgotten entirely is oil. The United States is now the world's biggest oil producer. We produce the majority of the oil we use, something like the types of recessions we had in 1973, 1979 um, aren't on anyone's um, top worry list anymore. So internationally, um, more likely to prevent a crisis by having better capitalized banks in places like Europe, better tools to fight it, a lot more resources and cooperative arrangements um, in place. Um, now let's come to fiscal policy. The United States has a lot more debt than it had a decade ago. I wish we had less debt. I don't think that debt is going to constrain us in fighting a crisis for three reasons. First of all, um, in some ways, our fiscal situation has actually improved. You don't want to just look backward. You want to look forward at all of our entitlements and all of those problems. Those are still there. They're smaller. Expected health spending has gone down. The deficit in Medicare has gone down. And when the Congressional Budget Office measures what we would need to do to stabilize our debt, 
they actually find that smaller now than it was a decade ago, largely um, because of some of those improvements in healthcare. Second, the measure of how serious your fiscal situation is what your interest rates are like. And interest rates now are much lower than they were before the crisis. Financial markets expect them to be more likely to fall than to rise, and that will give us a substantial amount of space to do fiscal stimulus um, if we need it. Third, there's now been a substantial body of research, and it's consistently found that fiscal policy is just as effective, if not more effective, in the situation we're in. So overall, our banking system is safer, our non-financial system is safer, our international system is safer, monetary and fiscal policy have just about as much room as they had before the crisis, so overall, Neil and I are arguing that the system as a whole is safer and urge you to vote for the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Jason Herman. And that motion again, 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. And here making his opening statement against the motion, Kenneth Rogoff, economist and professor at Harvard. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Rogoff. Thank <clears throat> Thank you very much to Intelligence Squared and to Foreign Affairs. And I often have to say the venue here is Hunter College. My mother was a graduate of Hunter College and uh, very proud of it. I, I, I want to start by saying when you have financial crises, the next war is usually pretty different than the last war. They don't always come from the same place. And it's, it's, it's certainly important to prepare for what happened last time. But I think a really critical element of the system is the leadership making decisions. When we had the financial crisis, we had a small number of people uh, that uh, included uh, uh, Neil and Jason uh, who were making decisions. And of course, more, my, most famously, Hank Paulson, Ben Bernanke, uh, Tim Geithner. Uh, it, it was a, a, a very strong team and, and they had support uh, President Bush, um, Ben Bernanke writes about this, even though he was a conservative and wanted to have tight budgets, well, except when he want cut taxes. <laughs> he said he wanted to have tight budgets. But, you know, he, went, he, he got up and said, we're going to do a, something like a $450 billion stimulus. Obama later increased that. That was very painful. But the point is they uh, ha had his support. We have, I, I think, excellent central banks now. Uh, the teams across the central banks, not just in the US, but the, in, in uh, England, in the European Central Bank, and excellent staff. But you need more than that when you have a financial crisis. Uh, you need uh, huge changes. Jason's mentioned fiscal policy. You need the support of the president. You needed the support of Congress. TARP, which was a very important part of dealing with the financial crisis. That was really something uh, Congress uh, struggled through. Um, if you look at uh, Mario Draghi as a central banker was famous, you may have heard this in Europe, for I will do whatever it takes. We will do whatever it takes and believe me, it will be enough. And when he said those words, it was considered absolutely a watershed in the European financial crisis. But believe you me, had he not visited Berlin first, and Angela Merkel said, I want you to do this, he would not have been able to because the governments own uh, the central banks. Well, I mean, I mean, the Fed team is still excellent, but I, I simply don't think you could describe that we're, we have a safe pair of hands uh, at the moment, uh, not just at the highest level, but the team. I'm sorry to appeal to this, I guess it's not fair, but it's the world that we actually live in. Uh, and even if we had competent technocrats uh, in other key positions outside the Fed, I'm not sure they'd be listened to. Uh, there are some good ones, uh, some, some ones my colleague uh, Greg Mankiw praised, uh, Kevin Hassett, who's the uh, uh, chief of the Council of Economic Advisors, which uh, uh, Jason had, and uh, he also mentioned Larry Kudlow. He didn't mention Steve Mnuchin, he's the Treasury Secretary, although surely had he seen Wonder Woman, Mad Max, uh, or his acting role uh, as IMDB has in a movie called Rules Don't Apply, um, he might have had a different uh, view. 
If, if you go across the pond, the UK is the other big financial system. They're like, you know, committing suicide right now in the UK, <laughs> and they're not even facing a real problem. I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's kind of clear uh, that, you know, you have a problem there. Uh, and, you know, in general, the problem's deeper than just the persons. It's uh, something having to do with uh, populism. Uh, let me just pick up on uh, a few other points. Um, I, 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 I do think uh, our ability to do fiscal policy is limited. I actually agree with Jason. It should not be. Uh, we should have, feel like we have a free hand. But I don't know if any of you, you know, follow our political system, but fiscal policy is actually not this sterile thing in a textbook. You decide who, not just whether you cut taxes, do you raise government spending, whose taxes, what do you spend on? And I don't have the impression, even in the United States, uh, much less some other countries, we're going to do this in a very nuanced way that's gonna work well. Uh, and as, as far as monetary policy goes, we can come to that later, but I actually think the tools are very limited and we have learned something. We have learned that a lot of these creative tools don't uh, really work very well. I do concede that the banking system, narrowly defined, is safer, but I think Bob made the point, the financial system is not necessarily safer. The, the t financial system as a whole is big, it's gotten bigger. There's, the IMF reports $200 trillion uh, in debt, and using Bob's analogy of a car on a hill, your brakes may have gotten better, but you're on a much higher hill than you were in terms of our financial system. Um, so uh, we can go into other things. I, I, interest rates are very low, but what if they're not? What if global interest rates, not because of policy, but something happened, they went up? We are not tuned to deal with that at the moment. There's so many things that would blow up. Uh, Italy uh, would be an example. The system is so uh, vulnerable to that. Uh, there are other issues uh, we can go into uh, later on the limits, but I think, um, I, I know it's not fair, but if you feel safer about anything right now, you're dreaming. Thank you, Ken Rogoff. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate where the resolution is 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. Now we move on to round two, and round two is where the debaters address one another directly, and they also take questions from me and from you, our live audience here in New York City. Our resolution is, 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. We have heard Neil Kashkari and Jason Furman make the argument that it's not that the system is perfectly safe, but that it is unquestionably safer than it was 10 years ago. The biggest banks are safer, their capital requirements are higher and encouraging and rational. The uh, shadow banking system is coming under more scrutiny than ever before. A lot of the sort of funky stuff that happened uh, 12, 15 years ago, derivatives, some of the funkier money markets, their activity is down by 75%. Then they talk also about the rescue system, that we have learned things as a result of what happened in 2008 in the aftermath, how to use tools and how to, how to experience. At the time it was an experiment, but the fact that the experiment was successful gave us um, new tools. And then they look overseas and they look at Europe and they say the Europe has learned a lot, that we have partners whom we can work with who know what they're doing. As for fiscal policy, the ability to spend government money to stimulate uh, government activity if necessary. They say that debt will not constrain us in that situation. So that's basically their argument. The team arguing against the motion, Robert Rosencrantz and Ken Rogoff, uh, they say it's not just about the banking system. It's one of their most important arguments that there are several other financial uh, markets, th those markets are getting bigger, they are essentially black boxes as they have always been, that inside of them there are computers running the system that lack a human hand uh, on the throttle, that they tend to stack the deck so that everybody's moving in the same direction at once without shock absorbers in the system such as counterparties uh, at, at the big banks which are now forbidden from trading for their for their own accounts. They say that banks are so intertwined that if one of them goes, uh, the rest of them are ripe for falling down like uh, dominoes. They talk also about the political stresses that the system uh, could be under and may be under. Uh, the fiscal stimulation uh, is, uh, is, is gonna be difficult 
uh, with the deficit for political reasons. Uh, do, do you trust uh, th those in charge these days, they ask. And finally, they look at China and they say that China is a much bigger player uh, than in the global system than it was uh, back in 2008 and is not such a cooperative partner. So there's a lot to unpack there, although I think uh, the structure of what we're hearing, we're, we're hearing about two sets of ideas. One is uh, the set of ideas of our, do we have the makings of, uh, of, of a new crisis, a repeat of some kind? Are there, are there those oily rags in the garage beginning to smolder and catch a spark and are they gonna burn down the whole house? And are, is that likely to happen? And then the second thing is, what if it starts? What if that fire starts? Do we have a way to put out the fire? Do we have the tools to respond to a fiscal, uh, a global uh, financial crisis? So again, a lot to unpack there, but I wanna go to, um, to the team arguing for the resolution and bring to you what I think is your partner's main uh, main, main parry to you, and a lot of details, but their main parry to you because you led so strongly with the notion that the uh, banking system is safer. Well, they conceded that pretty, pretty upfront. They conceded that, and then they more or less say, but that's not the whole story. It's much bigger than that. So take that on, Neil. You haven't, you, you spoke first, so if you could take that on, uh, the notion that they're, they're going to concede that point as a strategic thing and say a little bit of a so what. Well, as I uh, said in some of my comments, if you look at many elements of the financial system outside of the banks, it's also safer. As Jason talked about, derivatives, many derivatives now go through a clearinghouse where it's not just in the shadows, one bank to another bank, but they're centrally located, there's a lot of transparency. Securitization is way down. Money markets are much safer than they were 15 years ago. So you're right, there are still risks out there. But if you look at the whole financial system outside of the banking sector, on most dimensions, it is substantially safer than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Now, we're not arguing that there's no risk, that nothing can go wrong. The question is, is it safer than it was 10 or 15 years ago? On almost every dimension, it is safer. Bob Rosenkrantz to respond. Again, what Neil's saying is that on the, on the metric that we're setting up here, is it safer than it was 10 years ago that these, that these non-bank financial institutions are in fact safer than they were 10 years ago. Your response? Well, I, I, think the, I think what our opponents are addressing is the last war. They're sort of saying, well, if the same crisis unfolded again today, we'd be better equipped to deal with it. And generals are great at fighting the last war, uh, but nobody predicted the financial crisis last time. And I don't think anybody's predicting or can predict what might trigger it next time. It could be a political event. It could be something in Iran. It could be something in China. It could be something uh, out of control in terms of our relationships with China. It could be just random uh, change in mood in, in markets that has a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy to it. So I think the the... I don't find very satisfying the argument that we're better at uh, fighting the last war. And I think the things that make the next war look very dangerous to me are some of the, the points I made, that still the failure of one big bank can bring the system down. We haven't really addressed the independence or the interdependence of, of financial institutions. Okay, let me let Jason Furman jump in on that. So I, what Bob Rosenkrantz, I'm hearing him saying, is no matter where the, the next crisis comes from, the tools that were developed for the last time may not be relevant. Yeah, I mean, we've fought hundreds of wars. And if you want to read about all hundreds of those wars, um, Ken's book is, is particularly great on them. Um, a lot of them are the banking system. This isn't some random little footnote. That's been the source of a lot of the financial crises throughout history. And whatever goes wrong anywhere in the system, if our banking system has a lot more resources than it had, I feel better about it, no matter what the problem so is. Ju just, it also, ju just oh. to clarify, so, so you're saying, your, your response to their point that the banking system is now a small part of the overall sector is, actually, no, it's still pretty central. It's central to the financial system. And it has this feature that the banks borrow money very short term and they lend it long term. And that mismatch can create a problem because you, know, you get the it's a wonderful life type of bank run. Um, we've reduced the risk of that in the banking system, but you had that in, throughout the financial system. 
with lots of institutions borrowing in things like overnight repo, tri-party repo, and the like. They were putting up these securities that were terrible and junk, and then that, all of that collapsed. All of those parts of the financial systems, the way we made securities, the way we manufactured derivatives, the way institutions, you know, if they had what they had to hold against them, all of that we've changed quite a lot. It gets very technical and very boring quite quickly, um, but it's, you know, we don't know where it's coming next. That's why we're looking in a lot more places now than we were a decade ago. Ken Rogoff. Well, I, I first want to give an, another example in addition to what Bob said of like the next war. I mean, I think cyber war, cyber security is just, we just don't know what happens when something melts down. Actually, in the, in the uh, 2008 crisis, when uh, one of the key dealer brokers uh, was in the, the uh, Twin Towers uh, that, that covered a lot of the U.S. Treasury market, they just hadn't imagined there could be that problem. So you know, th that, that's uh, certainly an example. But also, uh, as you put constraints on the banking system, the stuff flows elsewhere. Interest rates are very low. People are looking for risk. So uh, Federal Reserve, former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen, you know, has commented on this recently. She, uh, the techno mumbo jumbo uh, is, you know, covenant light leverage loans, but very risky stuff without a lot of contingencies or collateral. And I, I think, I mean, obviously Neil has a lot of information on this, but uh, I think certainly I, I don't feel as an outsider that we know everything the banks are doing where they're lending to someone who seems safe, you know, hedge fund or something, and then they make a really risky loan, but implicit in some way it can come back on the, the financial system's books. Our banking system has always been at the center of crises, but our banking system's been shrinking, and that's one of the reasons the U.S. came out faster. It's less important to our system, and these other things have gotten more Can important. Let, let me, but let we me weren't even, Ken, we weren't even looking before. No one was looking at Lehman. Fannie and Freddie could borrow as much as they want. Now we're looking at them. We may not see everything, and Fannie and Freddie can't borrow all that they want. See, one of the challenges I have with your argument is that you're basically saying this is an unsolvable problem. That's correct. Because the next crisis is going to come from somewhere different, and you never know where it's going to come from, so there's nothing you can do about it. We've taken the smart, rational actions that by looking at the history of the world economy, where crises have come from in the past, made prudent measures to try to make sure that we're safer. And I feel very confident that we've taken important steps in the right direction. But to just say, well, we don't know, an asteroid might hit us, but what are we supposed to do with that as policymakers? Right? We have to make decisions based on data and analysis and history, and we've made smart decisions based on that, and the system is clearly safer. Just saying we haven't defended against an asteroid isn't very helpful. Bob Rosencrantz, is, is I, I, I don't think that's a fair characterization. I think what we're saying is that to make the system safer, you need to have banks that stand on their own two feet where the failure of one big institution... But you, but you the, already conceded the, that capital finish, helps. Please. Capital helps, right? Capital helps, but once an institution fails and it is absolutely as likely that it's going to drag the system down with it as it was 10 years ago. And what I think the main thing that could make the system safer is if you eliminated the, the whole subject of, uh, of, uh, of derivatives, if you made over-the-counter derivatives simply ban them, if you didn't allow banks to own the, uh, the uh, paper of other banks, uh, you have a lot of structural things going on in the system that in effect can create a domino effect set off by things that nobody can forecast. Jason? But, uh, and, and, and then let, let me just... Uh, uh, Bob, let, let, okay. let me let Jason uh, respond okay. to what you said there. Um, if you're worried that a bank will take the whole system down, they have twice as much capital as they used to have. Um, we had no bankruptcy regime for Lehman also. There's rules if just your sort of plain <laughs> vanilla industrial company goes bankrupt. There's rules if a small bank goes bankrupt. We had no way at all of handling Lehman. We have one on paper now. It goes by the name Resolution Authority. They've written out a living will, all of them, what they do. Again, do I think it's going to be perfect? Am I sure it's going to work exactly in a crisis? No. But boy, do I feel better knowing that we have those rules now to handle the bankruptcy 
of a large, complex financial institution. Again, derivatives, I think you're making our point. Do we you're believe about those rules? What? I mean, do we think they're going to allow a large bank to go bankrupt? Because the problem is that they've also made it hard for the Fed to do the more creative things that it did in order to avoid that. And it, I, th I think it's a very unclear. I think the market thinks, doesn't believe that they'd be allowed to go under. Let's move oh, to no. the, let, oh, oh, no, go ahead, Jason, if you want to finish that point. Oh, I, I think the Fed just needs to be a little bit more creative than it did last time, and if it does that, it can do everything, and I think the market's more realistic about the banks now. So, so Ken Rogoff made an argument that, that he doesn't think that we're in safe hands these days. He didn't mention anybody by name. Um, <laughs> but I think you get a sense that he feels that not only, and, and Bob Rosencrantz made this, the, the argument as well, that our alliances are frayed, uh, China, is not uh, necessarily a friendly interlocutor um, in the economic sense, and that if a crisis were to come today, they're arguing that we don't have the cool heads that would be able to handle it. Brexit, another, you know, also a mess, which is a serious partner last time. So, Neil Kashkari, take that argument on. You know, I was at Treasury from 06 to 09, and people may forget, in the middle of the financial crisis, we had a presidential election in 2008, Senator McCain and then Senator Obama, that was hardly political harmonious time. I mean, I was sitting uh, in the gallery above the House of Representatives when the House voted down the TARP the first time. I don't know if you remember, members of Congress were telling us their phones were ringing off the hook 99 to 1, <coughs> saying, don't you dare vote for this. Then the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 777 points that afternoon, and two days later they voted for it. Our democracy is deeply flawed, imperfect, but in moments of crisis we tend to come together. And I believe that in a moment of a future crisis, we came together in 2008, I believe in the moment of future crisis, American history has shown that we will come together and do what's necessary on behalf of the American people. That was what I lived, that was my experience in 2008. I think that's true today. Jason, I know you're dying to talk on this, but hold on, I want to let the other side respond, Ken Rogoff, and then I'll come to you. Well, I mean, you have to have, first of all, have guidance on what it is you want to do and that comes from the top. I mean, so the, yes, our democracy may be strong, but that doesn't mean that we'll handle <laughs> it well. I, I, I wanna uh, also say that we're looking not just at the United States, we have to think about the whole world. Do I feel safer about European banks? The market sure doesn't feel safe about Deutsche Bank, who sells at a fraction of its book value. Uh, if something were to happen with uh, the Euro, uh, the, their banks are very vulnerable. Uh, Chinese banks, maybe you say we don't care about, but we've never had a situation. They're, they're slowing down and could absolutely have a problem that radiates out. There, there are things that we, can, we can't necessarily anticipate. So, you know, to sort of summarize, you, you, you can have a, a flood and you build the, you know, you build your moat a little higher, your, you know, your seawall a little higher, but if you have global warming, it doesn't necessarily mean you, you became safer. Our financial system's gotten much bigger by measures of total debt, total financial assets. And I, let me, I let mean, me, I, 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 you're I, doing a great I, I, job, but it doesn't mean we're safer. Jason, you wanted to respond yeah. to the personality issue. Yeah, I mean, certainly I don't, at least not speaking for myself, I'm not gonna turn this into a debate for and against the people President Trump has chosen to appoint throughout his government. Um, but the fact that we had such good people last time and had such a terrible crisis, I think makes our point. If I had to choose between the best people in the world dealing with a financial system where you weren't watching most of it, where banks were undercapitalized, where there was a huge bubble, where you were making terrible loans, where households were going deeper and deeper into debt, or a system where the rules were a lot better, you know, a lot of those indicators were better, and the people weren't quite as good, I think I'd choose the system, especially since those people aren't necessarily there forever, um, and the system has a greater durability to it. So, um, you know, so, so I, again, would sort of rather have the hand we have now. Um, plus, the Fed plays an enormous role in this. The UK government has excellent regulators who are completely focused, even while all this craziness is going on over there. Um, China, um, you know, it's certainly a risk. Last time around, it did a huge fiscal stimulus. Part, it, it suffered from the crisis much less because they have three trillion dollars in reserves, huge amount of control okay. um, over there. I, I, I want to ask Bob Rosencrantz if what you just heard calmed your concerns. Um, no, 
um, because I, I think they're focused very, very narrowly on banks. And yes, they've created a regulatory environment where banks are doing less of what banks typically do. Why do we need banks in the first place? <coughs> we want them to make loans to businesses so that the businesses can grow. We want them to make loans to consumers so that the consumer can continue to support the economy. We want them to make markets in securities so that we can have orderly uh, uh, markets in times of uh, both boom and bust. Well, they've said the banks can't do that, or they can do much less of it. Does that mean that the system is safer? No, those risks and those activities are simply migrating elsewhere. Uh, we have a, a, as big a portfolio in the system of, of uh, loans than we ever had. It's just that the banks don't hold them, but those loans are at record high re uh, relationships to corporate earnings. They are covenant light now, so that the lenders don't even ha the the uh, lenders don't even have the same degree of protection they had a decade ago, and all of the these uh, risks that yes, they may have pushed out of the banking system are still very much a part of the financial system, and could fill against us in ways that uh, I think we're less equipped to deal with now than we were a decade ago. Okay, I want to go to audience questions, please. Hi, Van Greenfield. Um, my question is for Professor Rogoff. Um, you mentioned very briefly um, increased debt. Now, I remember when interest rates ran short term 17 or 18 percent. What would be the impact in terms of your arguments here um, of interest rates quadrupling from where they are now in terms of the impact on the system? I, I mean, I think if uh, global inflation-adjusted interest rates quadrupled, every, everything would blow up. Even the United States uh, would have a, a very hard time handling that. That is an extraordinarily unlikely. But if they went up 1.5%, Italy could blow up. Uh, their rates, risky lenders, uh, go, go up a lot more. That, that's the mother of all risks out in the system. We've had them trending down. It's quite possible. I'm talking about global inflation-adjusted interest rates. It's, it's likely they'll go down as up, frankly. It's not obvious what direction. But we're not a hedge fund. We're trying to add, you know, take into account outside risks. Fin giant financial crises do not happen every three years, uh, although you know, we're doing, I think, some things to uh, engineer that <laughs> uh, with, re with deregulation that's happened. Uh, and, and by the way, deregulation isn't just about the rules, it's about who's enforcing the rules. And when you appoint regulators outside the Federal Reserve who are sort of not enforcing the rules, and the way it's done at the, in the banking, in the financial system is not very different than the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, you know, you can, you can get problems. All right, um, I do want to go to a question, but I'd like you to respond because uh, I think something new is introduced from, by your opponents as another risk that they're talking about that represents a vulnerability they're saying in your argument, and that's that the regulations are not being enforced by, you know, the chickens are guarding the hen house, more or less, they're saying in some situations. Neil? I mean, I haven't seen any evidence that that's true. I travel around my region all the time. I meet with banks who are always saying that the regulations are too tough. Again, I want to be tougher on them yet, but so far we're not hearing banks that are not they're breathing a sigh of relief that now all of a sudden, you know, people have taken it easy on them. So, I mean, it's, you can make that assertion. I just don't see any can, evidence. Can were you referring to banks or were you referring to non-bank? No, the, 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 the whole financial system. But the, with banks, the question is, <laughs> what are they doing that you don't know where they're implicitly guaranteeing things outside their system that could come yeah. back on their Jason. books? Yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, I'm a little bit more sympathetic um, to, to Ken's point. And I think that's a little bit in the vein of, I told you before that we now have these rules that if an institution is systemically important, if it could bring the whole system down, we're allowed to regulate it. That's not something we had before. The Obama administration used that tool quite actively. This administration, I think, has used it less actively. That makes me nervous, but that, again, sort of makes our point that we had zero before the crisis, now we have this new tool, and we're using it half as well as I'd like us to use it. 
Um, the next administration could use it even more, and even the half we're doing so now, and the fact that it's on the books, is better than um, if we didn't have that tool at all. Okay, go to another question. So this is more, uh, sorry, Jolene Creighton. Uh, so this is more for the team that is for the motion. It sounds like you're saying it's less likely that we'll have a financial crisis given new systems and forms of oversight that have been put into place. My question then is, what if there is a crisis? Do you feel that the system can effectively deal with this given the current administration and Congress and so on? Thank you for that question. So that does go to the question of, do we, can we put out the fire if the fire starts? I think we have better tools than um, we had before. You know, as Neil said on fiscal and monetary policy, we're in about the same place. Um, with fiscal policy, you know, I'm worried about our political system too, but somehow we managed to do a massive fiscal stimulus last year when we didn't need one. If we really do need one again, I'll bet we can get around to it. Um, you have these rules that let you handle the bankruptcy of a large financial um, institution. You have central banks that communicate with each other across countries and share resources um, in a way that they didn't used to before. The IMF has twice the resources it had to fight a fire. Europe um, has a brand new, you know, 700 billion euro to fight it. So I think we have more tools to fight a fire now. It'll still burn down some houses, but I, fewer than it did last time. Okay, um, right down here. Good evening, uh, my name is Bob Young, and my question is with regard to OTC derivatives moving on to clearing houses. And while that is good in terms of transparency, does, what are your thoughts with regard to it concentrating the risk within those clearinghouses, particularly when you think about Ken's point around cyber risk? I think it's a fair point. I think there's a lot of scrutiny in these new clearinghouses from regulators to look at making sure that they have the resources that they need, that they are netting these positions against one another so that they're reducing the exposure that they themselves take. Uh, do I think it's perfect? No. But are we better off having these clearinghouses with this transparency than we were 10 or 15 years ago when it was the wild, wild west, I think unquestionably we're better off than where we were 10 or 15 years ago. So I'm not satisfied that we're done, but I feel very confident that we've made progress. In terms of cyber, when I look at cyber, it's an arms race. The bad guys are investing in new technology every day, so are the good guys. My best assessment is we're still roughly neutral. The bad guys have made progress, the good guys have made progress, the arms race is about where it was, 10 years ago, though the tools are probably different. Assess, for the team arguing against, assess where the cyber threat figures into your argument. No, I mean, the, the, this, we're, the, the risks of cyber war with the financial system being at the center of it, with Russia, North Korea, Iran, uh, and China being players that the uh, US, US intelligence worries about a lot. This is, this is actually going on all the time behind the scenes, uh, and uh, if it, if, let's suppose it paralyzed some bank and everybody became panicked that their uh, deposits are going to get erased or pension funds get worried about it. I mean, it could set off just a massive panic and not that easy to, to fix because the Fed can say, well, we'll promise you, you will guarantee your deposit. But wait a second, we don't see a deposit uh, for you anymore because the, the, of the cyber problems. I mean, I think it's... Uh, uh, this is a, a new age problem, I'm sorry, but I, I, think, I think it's uh, uh, you know, quite a significant one. I, I'd, yeah. like to, I'd like to add to that some other emerging financial technologies that in my mind have made the system more dangerous. Uh, for example, so much money now is in ETFs that uh, operate on an autopilot way, and that's true in, uh, in uh, investment grade bonds, it's true in below investment grade bonds, it's true in bank debt. Uh, so you've got, and it, it's true in spades and equity where so much money now is, is, is simply indexed and uh, expressed in, uh, in ETFs that, that are completely on autopilot. And the world has this illusion that, they, that everybody owns a liquid instrument, but when these intermediaries try to find liquidity to meet redemptions, that's when the system gets in trouble. And yeah, they've made the banks safer by not allowing the banks to participate in getting us out of trouble. Neil Kashgari, to respond? Well, you know, um, the, the point about cyber and these different actors, again, so many of our worthy opponents' arguments to me keep coming back to 
there are these risks that are unknown, and we haven't protected against the unknown. I agree. We have not protected against the unknown. That's why I make the joke that it's like an asteroid hitting us. We haven't protected against the asteroid. We have to take action on things that we can see, that we can learn from the past, that we can measure, and that we can analyze. That's all we can do as policymakers. And given the risks that have hit the global financial system in recorded history, we've taken the prudent steps to make the system so, safer. But can we dream up risks that we haven't thought of? Sure, but I don't know what you do. So about. Let, let's pick one you've missed, which is the ratings agencies just haven't been fixed. And the rating agencies are explain to, explain to the, the rate, standard and Poor's and Moody's. Uh, basically give ratings to bonds. They were big players in what happened in the last financial crisis. For if you were a consumer, they said it, would like, these, it would be like they, getting your credit score. Yeah, they, yeah said, okay. they said some of these things were really safe that weren't these complex uh, Rube Goldberg type uh, things that the financial sector created. And they, they, they still really have not addressed the problem that uh, who pays for these ratings? It's the borrowers pay for the ratings, and so that's okay, a so, terrible so kind that's of problem. Okay, so that's not an asteroid yeah. case that that yeah. Ken is presenting to you. Um, I agree. You know, if I, a lot of financial reform advocates had a list probably of about ten things they wanted fixed. We had that derivatives question before about the clearinghouses. You know, a lot of people were advocating for derivatives moving to clearinghouses for a long time from the public policy community. The financial institutions didn't like it, lobbied against it, and after the crisis, we stopped listening to the financial institutions, um, and we started um, listening to the experts, and we made the system a little bit safer. If you listed the 10 things that were in that category, um, I'll see you on um, ratings agencies. That's something we commissioned a study in Dodd-Frank, and I think the study was done, not much was done. Um, the other is the regulation of insurance is still done at the state level, not the national level, but those are sort of two out of the 10 things that experts wanted to see fixed that I think you know, weren't addressed in Dodd-Frank. But, but it's the same as it was 10 years ago. Right. So that's an example where it's neutral. It was a problem 10 or 15 years ago. It's still a problem today, but we've made progress in other areas. So on the whole, the system is safer. But the, the system's bigger. You, you've had a continued booming growth in the financial sector. So okay, you know, I, I, I want to move on because we record. are getting a little repetitive on some of that uh, point. So well, I just want to get a little bit we, more. Okay. Hi, my name is Brooke. Um, my question is for all four of you. Uh, in regards to the $1.5 trillion in student debt, it, in student debt outstanding. If default rates were to rise in the US government and the financial system, are they prepared to deal with that? And what are the greater ramifications of the US economic growth and the ripple effects in the global economy? Given that students now aren't starting families and they're not uh, buying houses uh, like they were before. I'm, I'm, Neil, you were, for yes? I, so I, it's the, the second part of your question is more what's the impact on, on families, but our, our debate is really about the global system, and I think the first part of your question lands perfectly. So I, if you don't mind, I'd like to have them address that part of it. Absolutely. You're good, you're good with that? Yeah, okay. I think that's the asteroid Neil was talking about. But I think he's going right. to say it's, well, they're going to say it's not an asteroid, but go ahead. Yeah, it's... I think there's a very simple answer to your question. There's a lot of problems for households, for families. We can talk about those another time. Almost all the student debt are guaranteed by the government. So if people don't pay, it's not going to take down the financial system or cause a financial crisis. That's not to say it isn't a big deal for those families, but it's nothing like mortgages, which weren't guaranteed and did take down the financial system. These are guaranteed. Um, and it's also a lot smaller than mortgages. I think about um, mortgages are about $8 trillion. Would the other side like to respond to the point? I, I would agree with that. You agree with that? Okay. Okay. Yep. It's fair enough to concede. Okay. Let's go back. Right down front, sir. Thank you. Uh, Brian Olasov. The question is for President Kashkari. You were talking before about the political will. Uh, if we were to confront any, any similar size magnitude financial crisis in the future, I think we've already heard Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke fretting openly that it's unlikely as successful retrospectively as TARP was, it would be politically infeasible, um, given the fact that it gave rise to the Tea Party and, uh, and probably President Trump. How, what's your level of confidence that we would be able to marshal necessary resources? Obviously, it's, it's hard to know for sure, but I read a lot of American history, and the more American history that I read, 
the more I realize that political dysfunction is actually the norm. We've had a lot of political dysfunction in our nation's history, and I'm not just talking about the Civil War, other times. And our country has a remarkable capacity when the country's on the line for people coming together and putting their country before their own immediate political interests. Now, a lot of members of Congress who voted for the TARP paid for it with their seats. They didn't get reelected as a result of it. And so, again, it's an, I, I wish I could tell you with 100% certainty that I know the political future. I don't. But I do have a lot of confidence in our overall system. I do have a lot of confidence that people do come together and put their country first when the stakes are this high. I'd like to let the other side respond to that question of political will. Well, I, I think you, you've, in a way, you've made our point. Um, Bailing out banks or bailing out financial institutions is never politically popular. It may be the smart policy thing to do, but it's never politically popular. And the fact that uh, people who did vote for it last time, uh, a lot of them lost their seats. You talk about what lessons have learned. Well, people in Congress have learned we don't want to bail out financial institutions. And, and the... Uh, the uh, Fed's powers to do that have actually been truncated by, uh, by, by uh, Dodd-Frank. So I, I think we are, have less political will to deal with, uh, okay. with these kind of crises Can, today uh, than we would very have had then. Yes. Yeah, super fast. Two days before TARP passed, TARP couldn't pass. The market, as Neil said before, crashed and that forced a set of action. I think it's really hard to predict Congress. I've been watching it for a while, and it constantly surprises me, um, occasionally even on the upside. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Hi, Milo Fallon. I have a question for Professor Rogoff. Earlier you mentioned populism, and with more and more countries such as Brazil or Italy, both major economies falling into populism, how will that affect the global economy and the system? Well, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, each case is different, but I think it makes it h harder to respond, certainly in the case of the democracies. And uh, I, I admire Neil's contributions and his uh, deep belief in the, you know, how, how powerful our country is. But, uh, I, I mean, you know, as Winston Churchill said, Americans, you know, always do the right thing after they try everything else first. <laughs> and I, I think it might be many years of trying everything else first in this case. Neil or Jason, well, I can give you 15 to, seconds. Just imagine the cyber example that Ken talked about, something we never thought of. It just hits us. North Korea hacks all our banks. If North Korea hacks all of our banks, you think Republicans and Democrats aren't going to come together to save our system? If it's something like that, of course they are. And so the more it's one of these asteroid events, the more likely our political system is going to come together and people are going to rally because it's something none of us had thought of. And that concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our resolution is 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. Now we move on to round three. Round three are closing statements by each debater in turn. These statements will be two minutes each, speaking first in the closing round for the resolution, 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. Jason Furman, former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion about the political system. That's why it's so important to me that it's less likely that we're going to be in that position. Neil and I talked about five different areas, three of them indisputably safer Two of them you could argue either side, I think largely neutral. Our opponents have tried to say we're just talking about the banking system. First of all, just talking about the banking system is just talking about the main source of crises for hundreds of years. But we're also talking about derivatives, money market mutual funds, Fannie and Freddie, throughout the financial system. But I want to step back and talk about one thing that goes beyond those five arguments I think is particularly important. The Great Depression. Unemployment rate went to 25%. Output fell 30%. The global financial crisis was bad. It wasn't nearly as bad as that. The unemployment rate went to 10. Output fell by 5%. Why not? In part, it's because we made the system safer. We put in place things like deposit insurance. But we also learned a lot. And people like Ben Bernanke and Christina Romer were students of the Great Depression. And they wanted to make sure it didn't happen again. And one of the lessons they learned is you needed to do fiscal policy. You needed to act bigger. 
we learned a lot from the Great Recession. Again, we didn't learn enough. We've forgotten a little bit more of it than I wish we uh, had. But we learned a lot. And the next time we get into this, we're going to have those memories. We're going to act more vigorously independently at the Fed. They're still excellent. We're going to act more vigorously on fiscal policy. And if the system isn't safe enough, it's because we need more of what we've done, not less. If you have a problem with where we are today, you need to identify how to fix it. And what I'd submit is every single one of the fixes is let's finish the list that we didn't get to, add to what we did, learn the lessons, and with all of that, um, we are definitely safer today. Thank you. Thank you, Jason Furman. And that's the resolution. Ten years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. Here to make his closing statement against the resolution, Robert Rosencrantz, chairman of Delphi Capital Management, chairman, Intelligence Squared U.S. Foundation. So I, I don't ask for your vote because I'm the chairman of Intelligence Squared. <laughs> I, I don't ask for your vote because I'm an amateur who got into the ring with professionals on no notice. I ask you for your vote because I think we made a better case. And the case is simply that the world has evolved in ways that is more dangerous. There is more money on autopilot uh, in ETFs, in, uh, in index funds than there was a decade ago. China is a much bigger player in the global system than it was a decade ago. Uh, mass psychology expressed through algorithmic trading and algorithmic uh, uh, portfolio strat strategies is a much bigger force than it was uh, 10 years ago. And the migration of risky assets away from banks to other uh, f places in the system doesn't make the system safer. It makes the system harder to manage. And finally, what about the political will or the political ability to respond. Well, that required a high degree of technical expertise, a degree of political coordination, and a degree of international co coordination that just seems to me to be far less likely today than it was 10 years ago. So if you agree, please vote our way. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Rosenkranz. The resolution, again, 10 years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. Here making his closing statement in support of the motion, Neil Kashkari, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, tonight. People often ask me, what was the financial crisis like for those of us who were there in the middle of it? And the only way I can describe it is it felt like we were in economic war. Every second of every day, what motivated us was trying to avert the Great Depression scenario that Jason talked about, 25% unemployment. Imagine your ATM not working. Imagine you go to work, but they can't give you a paycheck. How do you then pay your bills? How do you pay your mortgage, right? How do you, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I, I didn't think about that. Um, how do you put food on the table? So what motivated us every second of every day was how do we keep the system together one more day? I was working seven days a week, sleeping in my office. It went on month after month after month. And I never, ever, ever want to face something like that again. For my own sake, for the country's sake, given what was at stake. Having been through that personally, I can tell you without reservation, we are better off today than we were 10 years ago. For all the reasons that we talked about, the banks, the non-banks, all the other regulatory issues, the system is just stronger and safer than it was 10 or 15 years ago. I wish going into that crisis that we had the tools and the capital and the systems and the structure that we had today. We didn't have it, so we had to use belt, suspenders, duct tape, everything we could think of to try to get through that crisis, and we got through it, but we're better off today. And for that reason, Jason and I very respectfully are asking for your vote in favor of the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Neil Kashkari. And our final speaker will be making his closing statement against the resolution. Here is Kenneth Rogoff, economist and professor at Harvard. Uh, so our, our, thank you. Our esteemed opponents, I think, have uh, made a lot of good points, but they've wanted to frame the question, not are we safe, but are we safer? I don't actually think that's the right way to look at it. 
I think thanks to actions of theirs and some of the people we've talked about and under President Obama's administration, we are safer than we would be had they not taken those actions. But it doesn't mean that the system, which has grown inexorably larger, uh, more internationalized problems in uh, uh, other places, is necessarily safer than it would be otherwise. And uh, we were asked, well, what would you do? And I'm going to state what Bob said a little bit differently, but there is a, a wonderful book uh, by Anat Edmati uh, at Stanford and uh, Martin Helwig uh, in the Swiss uh, called The Banker's New Clothes. I highly recommend it to you. And they basically make the argument that you should have banks have much more of their own skin in the game. And in response to, well, there's twice as much equity as there used to be, a Knott's response to that is, you know, twice nothing is still nothing. There's very little. Uh, and another analogy uh, she uses is, okay, we used to have trucks yeah, loaded with stuff driving at 100 miles per hour. Now there's trucks loaded with more stuff, and they're only driving at 95 miles an hour, but it's not a very safe system. Uh, I, I, I wish I could tell you, you know, that you should uh, sleep better at night. Uh, I don't, I'm afraid uh, it, we live in this very uh, uncertain world, and I have to come back to the Trump argument, uh, which is simply, we don't have a safe pair of hands. I wouldn't feel good in any kind of crisis. Thank you, and thank you. Thank you, Ken Rogoff. And that concludes closing statements for this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I want to make the point that the purpose of Intelligence Squared is to uh, elucidate and illuminate complex, tough subjects where there are valid arguments on both sides and to do so in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere that is civil and respectful and informative and that depends on real facts and that depends on logic and persuasion and also some charm. And I think all four of the debaters tonight brought all of that and so I want to thank them for the way that you presented these arguments tonight. And um, we all met uh, Gideon Rose in the beginning uh, of the debate when we, we chatted about our partnership with Foreign Affairs. I, I just want to say it's been such a pleasure uh, working with Foreign Affairs to get this debate up and running. So uh, one more time, I just want to say thanks to Foreign Affairs for that. I, I want to ask a question, actually, of Neil, uh, since we have you here. Um, and it's... We're really pleased to have somebody who's actually a player in the middle of the game right now with your position uh, at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minnesota. Um, we talked a lot about interest rates tonight, and um, it, 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 it came up a number of times in a number of different contexts. Just for the context of where we are now, um, the Fed in last year raised rates three times, um, and um, uh, um, th they're, they're up at a range now to two, up to 2.5%. Uh, at the end of its, um, sorry, four times last year, three times in 2017. Um, you voted against them every single time. And we're just interested to know what, what, what would it take, what conditions would it take for you to change your mind? Well, the big surprise we've had is we kept thinking that we're at maximum employment. Everybody who wants to work is able to find a job. But then month after month, all these Americans are coming off the sidelines. I want to see evidence that we're actually there. Wage growth picks up. We really know that, okay, we're finally at maximum employment, and then that leads to inflation. So I'm not opposed to rate hikes ever, but I want to see evidence that the U.S. economy is finally hitting on all cylinders. Everybody's able to find a job who wants to find a job. When that happens, it'll be time for me to then go ahead and raise rates. <laughs> Thank you. I now have the results of your vote. Our resolution is this. Ten years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. Remember, it's the difference between the first and the second vote that determines who is our winner. On the first vote, in the resolution, ten years after the global financial crisis, the system is safer. On the first vote, 29% of you agreed with this resolution. 49% disagreed and 22% were undecided. On the second vote, the team arguing for the resolution, their first vote was 29%, their second vote was 35%, they picked up six percentage points, that's the number to beat. The team arguing against the resolution, their first vote was 49%, their second vote was 57%, they pulled up eight percentage points, they just, they just nicked out a victory on that, the team arguing against the resolution. Our congratulations to them.
Thank you for me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared U.S. We'll see you next time.